Last time you did a really good animation about top-down parsing. We had these sentences in this totally artificial grammar, which has only got about 30 words in it, all in all. But we uh, started here with sentence is subject, verb, object. And in the top-down approach, you basically say, OK, I'll push those on the stack in the reverse order. Subject, verb, object. And starting at the top of the stack at the left, you say, well, what can a subject be? So you do these things on your stack, top down, one at a time, and you start off at the root of the tree, and you develop the component parts left to right, one at a time. It is a lot easier, totally by hand, to write a top down parser rather than a bottom up one. But what I shall be getting to later on, and in fact I'm starting right now, is to say, well, what happens if instead of starting up at the root and developing the leaves of the tree, as it were, you start right down at the bottom with the text string that you know is correct and try and work upwards? You know, can you work back upwards from the leaves to the root? So in fact, let's write that um, test sentence below here. The robot stroked to furry. And actually, since layout doesn't matter too much at the moment, I'll squeeze the word dice in at the right there. Now, be clear, we're talking about bottom-up parsing now. In bottom-up parsing, you start with the string that you think is correct. And you say, start with a string. Can I look into the rules and see how to work up the tree, not down the tree? And yes, so therefore you're looking at possible matches on the right hand side for components of this string reading from left to right. Okay, the. How many ways are there you can match the string the against one of these classifications here? Well, the text, the string the, is the right hand side possibility of an article. That's one way to do it. Oh, and then look up here, right at the top of the grammar, if you have an article followed by a noun, like the followed by something else, that could be a subject. And that's looking good, because right up at the top of the grammar, we want to end up with subject, verb, object. Looking just at the robot, and looking at the grammar right-hand sides, I could do it by saying, well, it's the subject of the sentence, it's at the left-hand side, and if I go article, noun, I get the, and I get robot. But what I've done just to <laughs> act as a talking point, and it illustrates a lot of things here. I've given you a shortcut. If you want to, you can just do the robot with no further interior analysis at all. It's an allowed phrase, it's the subject. Now, I have to say that as we develop this story, we will get into bottom-up parsing, because one of the tools we're going to use, called Yak, basically produces bottom-up parsers for you, not top-down ones. And it's a Yak behavior symptom that it loves when you're trying to match text strings. It likes to match the longest one that it can manage. So it is going to seize on the robot all as one phrase as being a wonderful long solution. Why doesn't it just do the and then wait patiently for noun? That's not the bottom up way. <laughs> if you can see a longer, oh and this thing by the way that you're looking at is built up on a stack of course, it's called the handle. I get a longer handle by going for this option here and getting the robot all in one go. Okay, the robot then, and you've got to get used to reading from right to left now in bottom up parsing. The robot, all as one phrase, is an example of a subject. So we can now say, OK, the robot is my subject. Now that act of picking up a substring from your sentence and going upwards and making it more abstract, if you like, is called reducing in uh, bottom-up parsing. So looking for a longer and longer and longer string to get your handle, that's called shifting, because you're shifting characters one after another and making the string longer and longer and saying, can I go any further? So that's shifting. But when you say, oh, that's a nice long string and it matches, and then you go up and say, oh, that's my subject, that is called reduction because you're going to something simpler further up the tree. So you can tick that off as being done, bottom up. Next thing is, 
you see this string of characters called Strout. And once again, it's right-hand side driven. What is there on the right-hand side, and which rule is it, that could possibly match Strout? You see in here, against verb, bit, kicked or stroked. Those three strings are your possibilities, so that's fine. Going right to left, you say stroked is an example of a verb. So we've got our verb there. Now, again, cheated, but it's wonderful fun. I have not analysed two furry dice into adjectives and nouns and anything like that. I've just put it in as an interesting shortcut to have there. And it is an example of what I would call an object phrase. Some of you who are really good English linguists may want to go on about my lack of understanding about what a direct and indirect object are, not to mention predicates and so on, but please forgive me. I regard it as being an, a phrase in an object position. So I'm saying there's a quick match here. A bottom is going to love this. Two fairy dice, a great long handle. Oh, and if I match it there, what's the left-hand side it corresponds to? Obj. OK, then, we've won. We have worked bottom up to having subject, verb, object on our stack, starting with the string. And what's more, we've exhausted the string now. It's the end of it. There's a sort of full stop after that. There we are, then. We've got top down, which tends to be more uh, how should we say, eager, you know, a top-down parse would very probably leap on the word the and not bother to go any further because it's found a quick match for it, whereas bottom-up is the other way round. It's basically saying I want the longest possible handle. Even at this stage in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a sneaky suspicion coming around that actually bottom-up parsing was a little bit more powerful than top-down. Um, I'm going to put out a set of notes for this so that you can look up for yourself just examples of why it is more powerful. But roughly speaking, I think you can sense that because you've not only got something you're looking for, but you've got a handle that you've already accumulated. It's like gathering more contextual information going bottom up. But on the other hand, handling the stack and working out what's happening is a dull sight more complicated if you do it by hand coming bottom up. Rather than do it all by hand, why not me and you lot? It's a good way to learn Lex and Yak. In other words, don't write the C directly yourself. Get a software tool of these, like these two to do it for you. So that's exactly what we're going to do. I've got the program Putty that does SSH connected here. I'm talking to my other Linux machine in the other room where I have got set up a parser complete parser, front-end, let's go analyze our syntax analysis for this furry grammar and all legal sentences in it. And I know, first of all, you will want me to call up the program that implements this, and the test sentence, first of all, is... The, the robot's, robot's throat, throat to furry, furry dice. dice. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, furry, it's hanging there. It's waiting for us to give a correct furry sentence. Dice. Return. Look at that. It's happy with it. I've given it in subject, verb, object order, and I have numbered those rules in the grammar, as I showed you earlier, and I now have, as it were, a map of how it has parsed it. Rule three. Now that is the one that <laughs> effectively says I can do the robot all as one phrase. It has chosen not to go for the and robot as article and noun as separate entities. It might well have done that had I gone top down. But because this yak confected parser system goes bottom up, it's gone for the longest possible handle at that stage and it's matched it. Rule four, the middle piece, it's matched, stroked as the verb. And finally, it is spotted right at the very end that I put in another sneaky shortcut, two furry dice is rule six, and that is my parse. So, should we try one more, just to make sure? Go on, Sean, tell me which one to try. Um, the woman bit the dog. Yeah, the woman bit the dog. There you are, look. Rule two, the woman, now rule two, not rule three. If it's followed rule two, it's gone down the article noun route, which means it knows that's the only way to match the, wo uh, the woman. There is no shortcut way, okay? 
Rule four, verb, rule again, it chose bit. Rule five, now this time again, there is no shortcut to two furry dice at rule six. You've got to go the long way around and following rule five, you'll break it down into article, noun again, the and dog. So there we are. We, you could say, well, you've written a compiler for the furry language with the help of Lex and Yak. And we can go into details of that later if need be, but not now. It's fair enough, but it's not doing anything really, is it? What more should we do with this now? We've written it this far then, Sean, <laughs> you tell me. Well, I think next time we need to come up with an action. It needs to do something with it that. It needs to transform that grammar in some way. Those of us, those of you who in the previous video actually bother to look at the extra bits may have had a sneak preview as to what we're going to do as our much more interesting actions now we have recognised the innate structure. So remember, always watch the extra bits. Computer scientists began to say, well, you know, this is great because if we're writing a computer language like Algol 60, we can have the whole of the Algol 60 grammar displayed to us. And as we're writing it in assembler or whatever, we could have half an eye on what to do next because...